On May 22nd, Poudre Fire Authority, in conjunction with Loveland Fire Rescue Authority and Laramie Fire District 2, conducted a live fire training burn of an acquired structure located in Larimer County. The purpose of this burn was to demonstrate the use and effectiveness of the fog nail for suppression of attic fires, provide training for fire investigators of the involved agencies, and ultimately provide a complete burndown of the structure for the property owner. Poudre Fire Authority has recently placed fog nails on all frontline apparatus. It's important to note that our approach to fires in confined spaces is to keep them tight and apply effective water for the purpose of gas cooling and heat absorption. The fog nail is one of many tools available for this and these burns were used to illustrate its effectiveness in achieving this type of fire suppression. After teaching gas cooling principles, PFA has had multiple attic fires which were mitigated with an inch and three quarter hand line. To reiterate, the main goal with fires in attics and confined spaces is to keep them tight, strip the energy from the space which allows us to safely access them, and then conduct final extinguishment. In this way, we provide a higher level of property conservation by using less water and less destructive means of extinguishment. Many water delivery devices can function in this manner, therefore it is important for firefighters to understand the effectiveness of each and to choose the right tool for the situation. Speed and ease of deployment should always be part of the decision-making process. The training consisted of four burns and data was collected on the first three. The first two were attic fires, the third was a room and contents fire used for fire investigator training, and the final was used to burn the structure down. For the first three burns, three mode thermal imaging cameras were used. As temperatures increase and decrease, you will see the camera switch between high, mid, and low sensitivity. This is important to understand when watching the thermal footage. The mode indicator is located in the upper left corner of the screen and each mode will change the temperature range located along the right edge. Here is an example of a mode switch on the thermal imaging camera as it switches from mid sensitivity to low sensitivity. The overall image appears to be improving or dropping in temperature during this change, however, in reality the conditions are getting worse. This is represented on the temperature scale along the right side when it switches from reading a max temperature of 500 degrees to a max temperature of 1220 degrees. It is important to understand that with attic fire suppression, smoke conditions will not instantly change after water application in most cases. Assigning someone to take temperature readings from attic vents or a small hole from underneath will be our best indicators of effective water application. Pay close attention to the smoke conditions after water application in the first two fires. Both attic fires were ignited with a one megawatt fuel crib that was placed in the center of the attic. Three access holes were cut into gable ends since this attic did not have natural ventilation. The gable vent openings were used to assist with fire growth and ventilation control. The first attic fire was suppressed using a restrictor fog nail through the top of the roof using 10 seconds of water application. In these videos, you will see an internal live camera, internal thermal imaging, exterior footage from ground level, and exterior drone footage. The internal thermal view will provide instant feedback on the amount of energy that is absorbed with the water application. Pay close attention to the gable end closest to the fog nail. Shortly after the first water application, you'll see smoke production stop for approximately five seconds. This is due to the rapid cooling of the attic space and the contraction of the gases inside. Here is a graph of the thermal coupler data from the first burn. The second attic fire was suppressed using an attack fog nail through the north end gable using 30 seconds of water application. In these videos, you'll see two internal live camera views, drone footage from the south side, and thermal drone footage from the north. We had a failure of the internal thermal camera for this fire. If you pay close attention to the thermal drone footage, you'll see a heavy heat signature from the south end gable at the top right of the screen. Once water is flowed, the heat signature goes away. 
The IR heat signature of the whole house and roof will stay the same even after suppression. This again shows that taking thermal readings from the roof decking will not be a good indicator of effective water application for some time. The stored heat in the dimensional wood and asphalt shingles takes a long time to dissipate. On the other hand, using thin attic vents that change temperature rapidly or small holes from underneath gives us a better idea of temperature changes in that space. Here's a graph of the thermal coupler data from the second burn. The third burn was a room and contents fire that was set up specifically for fire investigator training. A fog nail was not used for suppression in this evolution. A piercing nozzle made by Flashpoint Equipment was used through the exterior wall to control the fire because this was not an NFPA 1403 acquired structure burn. The fire was ignited using a trail of dryer sheets and mineral spirits as an accelerant. The fuel load in the room was one full size box spring and mattress and one recliner. A smoke curtain was placed in the front door before the piercing nozzle was flowed. If you pay attention to the smoke curtain, when water is flowed, you'll notice the curtain being drawn back into the structure. Again, this is an indication of the rapid cooling effect of the water application and the contraction of the gases inside the room, creating a negative pressure effect. In the final phase of this training operation, we did a complete burn of the structure. All the windows and doors were opened and the furniture was placed by every window and ignited from the exterior. No data was collected during this burn, but the firefighters and officers that were assisting in this training commented that this was an invaluable experience. Crews were able to experiment with water application into rooms of the house and the attic and visually see the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of the stream. In addition, our 19-member consortium recruit academy was able to come out to observe the burn. This opportunity allowed for discussions relating to the fire dynamic concepts and principles they learned in the academy, looking at flow paths and using them to explain why fire spread to certain rooms faster than others, how a little water applied in an efficient manner can extinguish large volumes of fire relating it to its latent heat value. Thank you to the following partners and sponsors. We hope everybody enjoyed the information that we shared about our acquired structure burn. Right now what we're going to do is we're just going to quickly review what we recommend as far as tactical priorities when we're on structure fires where we believe or we know that fire has gotten into the attic. <clears throat> and then we're just going to spend some time kind of talking about some of the scientific principles that kind of back up that approach or those tactical priorities. So for our tactical priorities for uh, attic fires, number one, quick aggressive primary search. As we know on any structure fire, as soon as we can clear that, go in there and remove anybody uh, that's at risk, all the better, and it improves our operations moving forward. And number one, that's what we're there to do. Um, so if everything else fails, but we get everybody out of the house, then it's a victory. Number two is we gotta search for and extinguish where the fire started. 
So if that's outside into the house and into the attic or inside a room of content into the attic, wherever that fire started, that's our priority. And we have to be very thorough in looking for that. Even if it is uh, possibly a fire that started inside the wall, inside the house and spread up into the attic. So using thermal imaging devices inside the structure when we're doing primary search, if we're not finding anything obvious, scanning those walls is gonna be critical. <clears throat> once we extinguish those fires or where the seed is, and once the problem is isolated to the attic, we can slow things down. Um, from there, our priority is to get effective water into that space, okay? So we wanna put water into that space that's gonna strip the energy out. And ideally, the best way to do that is gonna be a fog pattern. And we'll talk about when we get into the scientific principles uh, section shortly after this, we'll explain why that's the case. Um, and that can be done with a fog nail, it can be done with an inch and three quarter. Your placement and location of that is up to you. There's no one better option and it's gonna be situational dependent. It could be from down below, it can be from the side, or it can be from up above. You have to pick that based off the situation and the best way to get water towards the area that's the hottest. Um, while we're doing that, that's when we can start isolating where we're gonna set up our surface cooling um, approach to the attic fire from underneath. So maybe shutting doors to unaffected rooms, putting down tarps, removing furniture, and protecting as much property as we can before we open up that space. Once we get effective water in there and we've taken there uh, and seen a drop in temperature, then we can open it up. And again, we can't base our temperatures off of roof decking surfaces. Uh, we have to try to find things that are connected or actually tick and get temperature readings from inside that space. Once we confirm that we have effective water application, we can open it up very professionally, two foot by two foot hole, get a firefighter up in there, start scanning and looking for those remaining hot surfaces and then mitigating those using as little of water as possible. Um, that's what we're finding is the best approach with attic fires, taking that complex uh, situation, narrowing it down and managing it through better water application. We're finding that we're putting out attic fires using a lot less water. So with the science side of thing, what we're gonna be doing and looking at um, and uh, showing some small scale experiments on are gonna be uh, gas cooling and contraction. We're gonna be spending some time talking about surface areas and why it's important to understand the concept of surface area, surface area of fuels and the surface area of our water application. And then we'll be relating those to our attic fire tactics. The conceptual approach to attic fires has to do a lot with the difference between surface cooling and gas cooling. And in all fire attacks, we're gonna have a combination of both. Now the extent as to which we do both or the effectiveness of both will vary depending on <clears throat> what we're trying to achieve and the tools that, that are being used. All fires will end with surface cooling. And that's important to understand. Along with that, it's very important to understand the difference between gas cooling and surface cooling. And the times that you're gonna to wanna to use each one of those. So when we look at the concept of gas cooling in general, we can illustrate this by a very simple uh, demonstration that a lot of people have seen where we just light a candle. Underneath the candle, I have a baseline of water. And then I'm gonna take basically a glass uh, cylinder and we're gonna put it over top of the candle. Now everybody's seen this before, but a lot of people have a misunderstanding of as far as what's occurring with this. So I'm gonna put the cylinder over the candle. We're gonna see that there's no water actually inside the cylinder. The candle's able to burn for a little while, and eventually it's gonna consume all the oxygen. As it consumes the oxygen and as the candle goes away, the water level inside the cylinder is going to change. As this happens, the questions that we always ask folks when we demonstrate this is why is this occurring? What's happening to create that void inside the cylinder to draw the water up? And a lot of times people will say, well, the oxygen is being consumed, <clears throat> so that's creating the void, and that's what's drawing up the water. So the candle goes out, and we can see that the water level inside the cylinder rises up and actually lifts the candle up and makes it float. Like I said, a lot of times people will say, well, the oxygen is being consumed, so that's what's creating the void. And as the oxygen gets used up, it uh, creates a negative atmosphere inside there, and it draws the water up into the cylinder. <clears throat> well, as we know from the laws of conservation of mass, that that's not the case. Um, with any chemical reaction, it's taking a certain amount of products, they're being used, and then the equal amount of mass um, 
uh, in return stays the same, they might just be different products. And so really what's happening in here is that we have a, the candle's burning, it's going through a chemical reaction, and it's producing byproducts. So the amount of mass inside that cylinder is always going to remain the same. What's changing is, is that the heat is changing, okay? So the candle inside there <clears throat> is heating up all the gases inside. We can't see the gases, but it's heating them up. They're moving around and they're expanding out. That's keeping the water out of the cylinder. As soon as the candle goes out, our heat source goes away and the ambient temperature through the glass immediately starts cooling the gases. Those gases start to slow down and they start to come together. As they come together, that's what's creating the void. Okay? And so basically what that illustrates is gas contraction. And as you saw in the video with the first attic fire that we did, when we deployed the restrictor pattern through the top of the roof, we saw a, um, a halting or a stop in the smoke production coming out of the gable end. And that was due to gas contraction. Uh, the water placement into the attic space was very effective in just cooling the gases. Okay, there was a, I'm sure there was a little bit of surface cooling going on in there, but the majority of the heat absorption that was occurring was occurring in the gases. And as we cool those down, they basically come together, they contract and do just what we saw with the cylinder. That's what's occurring. After that cooling effect wears off, we saw the smoke production coming back out again. And it's very important to know in that video, and you can go back and watch it, that the smoke conditions did not look different. After water application, and even though we took the temperatures from 1,000 degrees down below 200, the smoke that starts coming out of the gable end still looks nasty. And that's due to the fact that we didn't get much surface cooling going on in there. So those surfaces inside the attic space are still hot, they're still smoldering, and they're still pushing off smoke. But the difference is, is that we've taken the temperature, again, from 1,000 degrees down below 200, completely inhibiting the fire's ability to propagate. So when we look at the difference between gas cooling <clears throat> and surface cooling, it's very important to understand the difference between um, surface area. <clears throat> and when we all went through the academy, our IFSA books talked about surface area, <clears throat> and really they just kind of talked about it in terms of fuel. So we're going to give a couple fuel examples here relating to surface area to kind of illustrate those points. The one thing that our IFSA books didn't do was draw the connection based off of the fuels that we're trying to control, understanding their surface area, and then matching our water application to those fuels, okay? So an example would be solid surfaces, right? Where we'd want um, surface cooling. <clears throat> those surfaces are low in surface area. They take a long time to heat up, and they take a long time to cool down. So we want water application that has low surface area. So big droplets over those surfaces over a long period of time, that's what's gonna cool them down. Smoke is a different uh, animal. It uh, has high surface area, you know, thousands and millions of di small different or particles increasing its surface area. So when we're trying to control those gases and cool them down, we want a water application that's gonna have the same surface area. So if I, I have the same material here, we have steel wool, one's balled up really tight and the other one's spread out really thin. So this is low surface area fuel. And if I try to ignite it, if I can get my lighter to work, you can see that the outer surface wants to start to char, but it's gonna take a long time for it to really do anything. If I move it over to this other one, where it's spread out, we get a different reaction. And it's solely based on the surface area. Low surface area reacts very quickly, okay? And so that's just a demonstration of the fuel. But if that was on fire, a fine water droplet is gonna be more effective on that than a solid stream. If this eventually caught fire, then we're gonna want a solid stream versus a fog pattern. We need to match the water application to what is burning. <clears throat> so we're gonna do, just kind of cover some, a little bit of flame theory here there's it's amazing what we can learn from just a simple candle flame so I'll get this going drip some wax down there just so it can kind of hold the candle for us and it's been a while we've done a little bit of these small scale experiments for our department but it's just been a while so I figured with um, the acquired structure burn 
being fresh in our minds, it's a good opportunity for us to review some of these scientific principles. So one thing that we've talked about within our department is that if we take <clears throat> a wire mesh like this and we cover up the candle like so, if you look up from up above down below it, you'll see that it's hollow. And that's one thing that's very important to understand when we look at a diffusion flame and that's exactly what a candle flame is. And the flames that we combat inside structure fires are diffusion flames too. So it's very important to understand that there's no combustion actually happening inside the flame. It's only happening on the outer edges. So one of the questions that we always ask when we do this screen test <clears throat> is that when I put the screen over top of the flame, how come it pushes it down? And this is something that Lars Axelsen did in one of his many uh, teaches, you know, talking about flame theory and the questions that he, he posed in those little sessions. And so we have three things that we need to have fire, right? We need heat, fuel, and oxygen. So what's the one thing that's being taken away? Why does it push down the flame? And how come we don't have any flaming combustion up above the screen? And the answer is, is that what we're taking away is the heat. And so if we look at this substance, right, we have wire that's in a mesh pattern and the surface area is very high, okay? So the material itself is not big, but it's oriented in a way um, that increases its surface area and it basically acts as a heat sink, okay? So I can push that down and basically what the screen is doing is it's taking the heat out of the equation, okay? Because what's burning in here is gases. There's no solid surfaces burning. Uh, the wick, the initial flame that we provided to the candle melts the wax, the wax goes up through the wick and then that heat that's already there basically takes the wax from a liquid state, turns it into a gaseous state. So we have a gaseous flame here. Okay, and so things of high surface area are very good on gases, okay? And so basically this screen is taking out the heat from the candle. And we can see that if I try to light the smoke up above, it'll, it'll ignite, okay? So there's still fuel up there, but basically having it pass through the screen is pulling the heat out of it. So when we look at the 3D model of firefighting, that's what's happening. If we take a fog pattern or distribute our water in a very, you know, fine mist, lots of small water droplets, this is one dimension of those water dro droplets going through that hot environment. And with a fog pattern, basically we have layers and layers and layers of this, this heat sinking material basically pulling the heat out of the environment. And that's why we saw those rapid drops in temperatures in our study burns <clears throat> using both the fog nail um, and the piercing nozzle that, uh, that we use for those burns. Another illustration of this is just basically using uh, a piece of wire. So I have this wire oriented in basically a straight piece and then I also have it co coiled up here. Okay, So if I take this wire and put it through the flame, you can see that it has no effect on it. Okay. So this straight wire can be symbolic of a straight pattern, okay? If we try to send water in a low surface area through a hot environment, it's not gonna have any effect on it, okay? Straight patterns are very good on hot surfaces, okay? But if we take that same material, okay, and this is basically an illustration of our water, and basically just reorient it so that it has more surface area, let's see the effect that it has on the flame. So same material, but it does a good job of doing just exactly what the screen did of pulling the heat out of it. The other thing that we want to talk about is uh, steam conversion. And oftentimes when we talk about steam conversion, people worry about steam expansion. And we do get expansion. But the important concept to understand about conversion is that it does matter where the conversion is taking place. And typically, we're gonna get more steam expansion with a solid stream water application when they're striking surfaces, as opposed to a fog pattern where we're trying to gas cool. And here's the reason why. <clears throat> if we send a straight pattern through a hot environment, just as you saw when we demonstrated with this little piece of wire, it's not, that water passing through that hot environment is not gonna do anything. So that water is gonna strike a hot surface, break up a little bit, we might get a little bit more gas um, 
you know, cooling with the broken up water. But a lot of the conversion is happening with the water that's striking the hot surface, okay? When that conversion's happening there, it's pulling energy from the hot surface, okay? So it's not doing anything with the gases, it's pulling energy from the hot surfaces, creating steam, and that additional mass is getting pushed back out into the atmosphere or the other gases in that space. Now, the contrary is, is that when we're trying to cool gases and we send uh, thousands of small water droplets into that hot environment, the conversion is happening in the gases. So when the water droplet gets converted from a liquid state to a gaseous state, that takes a tremendous amount of energy, okay? And that's happening a thousand times over. And that's how we're getting those big drops in temperature so fast when we gas cool. And so when it happens, uh, steam is getting converted, but due to the rapid drop in temperature of that space, the conversion gets overrun by the amount of contraction that's happening. So a lot of times, if anything, we see a negating factor, no increase in pressure, and the recent UL study on uh, basement fires proved just that. And if anything, just like we saw with our acquired structure burn, we're gonna see a negative uh, effect that basically where we stop seeing smoke production for maybe about five seconds, or like we saw in our third burn where the smoke curtain got sucked back into the house due to the rapid cooling, okay? And so that's the difference. That's when we're gonna have <clears throat> more steam expansion is when we're applying rapid amounts or lots of uh, amounts of uh, big water droplets onto the surfaces. We're gonna get more expansion. expansion. If we just strip the energy out of the gases and we can put water into those um, hot gases and the conversion happens there, we're actually gonna get contraction. Um, so we hope that you under, uh, understand the concepts. We hope that you enjoyed the video. And if you ever have questions, don't ever hesitate to reach out to somebody on the Fire Behavior Committee. We're always here to help. Thank you so much.